Yep. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the invitation, Tina. Actually, one small correction is, is that uh, since I'm from Thailand, our our short name is actually what we use. So it's not for convenience. It's mm -hmm. or apparently the entire country is doing it for convenience. So it's it's the norm, I guess. And so I, I'm a PhD student at Shamus, as you may have heard, and I'm working with Professor Anna Sram, and we work more quite a bit with Arabino silence and silence so that, that is and also with uh, how we can use scattering techniques such as x-ray neutrons and a bit of light scattering to see if you can try and understand the structure and dynamics that's going on in these applications and uh, I will try to speak a bit about how we use scattering in the first the works that are in the first half of my PhD uh, if this would like to go so as, as Francisco gave a very nice introduction in one of his very many materials, uh, I work quite a bit with Wheat Brand, where we mostly have Arabino Silent. Uh, if you look at the last bullet point, basically it is part of the reason why we are so interested in looking at hemicellulosis, because in this particular biomass, it, there is actually, according to literature, more Arabino Silent per weight than there is cellulose. So then, of course, if we don't understand what is going on with the hemicellulosis, then we are not able to fully utilize this very, not quite a large underutilized source of natural polymers. And my background is a bit more in polymer, polymeric materials and polymer science. So a lot of the way I approach these, uh, these problems is to try to apply what we know with polymers, genetic polymers, and see how much of it applies to natural biopolymers. And you get quite a lot of interesting insights by looking at it that way. And I kind of missed to introduce it in the beginning, but I am part of a research consortium called Fiber. And we aim to design lignocellulosic based thermoplastic based materials. And what thermoplastic means in the simplest definition is that we can melt process it or we can melt shape it into a certain shape. So what you see here is a very common processing method, it's extrusion. So it's melt extrusion. And you would probably think that it's polyethylene or polypropylene or some kind of genetic polymer being extruded here. Uh, but this is actually one kind of modified Arabino silent or AX for short. And the goal of my PhD is really trying to understand all the processes that are involved in obtaining this material, why certain reactions are needed, how that affects the polysaccharide properties, and also, quite importantly, how the structure of the polysaccharide of the AX starting material affects the material properties. And as uh, to spoil a bit, there is a huge difference. So if I'm not going to say what exactly what it is, but by using different Arabino silence, we get very, very different uh, polysaccharide film properties out of it. So you can see the blue one is very soft and it stretches very, very well. The light green one is a bit more brittle and we are trying to understand what is going on using a combination of scattering techniques and also conventional thermomechanical testing methods. So in the first part of the talk I will talk a bit about how different Arabino silent starting materials can be studied using x-ray scattering uh, and so what we do is we we use alkali extraction to extract Arabino silent from wheat bran and doing that we get quite most of the available Arabino silent extracted from a wheat bran. And then from this mixture, what you can do is since each Arabino silent, depending on the chemical composition, has quite a bit of a different solubility in water, by fractionating with different amount of ethanol, you can obtain different fractions. And they are quite well separated by their Arabino societal content. Uh, to the right, you have kind of a representative schematic of what they could be. So the, the patterns of the linkages are very complex, as Francisco was saying. And I don't know if we have a proper answer on what its distribution is right now. But on average, we know that there are three, three Arabinos to 10 silos, for example, in the first batch. And in the final fraction, so this is the most water soluble fraction, there is almost there is 0 0.9 Arabinos per silo. So there's, on average, almost one Arabinos for every silos residue. But of course, we know that the, there is quite complex substitution patterns. It can be monosubstituted, it can be disubstituted. 
there are some possibilities where the Arabinos can substitute on another Arabinos, and that is not shown here. And so these are very, very complex polymers from that kind of sense. And so if we just look at the starting materials, and so the reaction that I'm doing is mostly in water. So for our sake, we are interested in seeing how these behave in water just from a starting material point of view. And actually doing solution state, X-ray scattering can actually tell you the exact shape or confirmation of what you have in the solution. So to take the, the best example, the ideal polymer is if you have your reactant is kind of, it's kind of soluble in the solution, in the, which case you would get something similar to this blue line or blue curve here. And this is the, high, the highest branch arabinocylon. So when you look at a solution state, small angle X-ray scattering, what you are probing is basically the probability and the mass density of your particles in the solution. In the case of polymers, you can see how the chains are behaving if they are in a good solvent, in a bad solvent, if they are flexible, if they are coiling up based on the probability of finding the scattering unit at different wavelengths or at different length scales. Yeah, it's, it's a very heavy look into which I think other people can go into better. But basically what you are looking at is at very, to the right, at very high Q. So this is in reciprocal space. So at high Q, you are looking at very small length scales. So if you go to powder diffraction, or for example, you're looking at, at angstrom length scales. So in the rightmost part of the diagram, you are looking at a very small segment of a polymer chain or polysaccharide chain. So here you are seeing that there is kind of a scaling with to the minus one and to the minus one is usually related to a rod like shape. So a lot of polysaccharides are kind of this stiff rod in solution. So basically what you get from looking at the part of the scattering curve that has a very straight linear decay is it gives you the persistent length. It tells you how stiff your polysaccharide is in the certain solvent. And then in the leftmost part, you see their statistics, how the Basically, you see how they interact with the solvent. You see if they are in a good solvent, you see if in they're in a bad solvent, you see if they're solubilized, you see if they're in a gel, you see if they are in aggregates. Uh, for example, if you look in the 0 0.5, which has a bit less arabinos, you see that the slope at the left side at the larger length scales, when you look at larger networks, larger structures, the slope has a much higher intensity. And in this case, it kind of signifies and you can show it empirically that the, this comes from having a gelling network. And as Francisco was showing in some of his films, you can get a mesh size. So basically you can tell, you can kind of estimate the size, the distances between one chain to the next chain. And that gives you kind of the distances of the net, like a mesh size. And you can do that by looking at the slope in the leftmost size. And then if you look at the very, very lowly substituted arabinocylons, they are very poorly stabilized in water. And you can see that we don't really see the rod-like structure in the right side anymore. So basically this tells us that we don't even get any individualized solubilized chains because we, don't, we are not able to observe any characteristic features that you would see from a, a solubilized chain. So everything is kind of aggregated. And then if you go to the left side of spectra, you look at the longer length scales, you see that the intensity is even higher in this case. So basically, it tells, since it's a measure of mass density, something that is more dense than a gel network is starting to become kind of like a clump of aggregates. So in this case, you can see that the lowly branch Arabino are, uh, and very simply, they are very poorly soluble. So you're probing very large spherical aggregates in this case, for example. And for my project, we are very curious to see how these different starting materials would behave if you try to do modifications or try to do reactions on them. And we would expect them to kind of behave differently because one, they might not even react or they might have inhomogeneous uh, reactions and so on. So uh, moving on, I'm skipping, I'm skipping parts of the middle sections because a lot of those are work in progress and there is not enough time. 
so in the first part, I talk a bit about how you characterize your solution, your politicalizing solution. And then in the second part, we made films, melt compressed films out of them. So we managed to make them melt shapeable. So if you want to look at these melt shapeable materials, we look at the solid materials. So we are, now we are scattering from a solid film. And the a lot of things you observe are very different. So I, I will try to give some examples of these structures you can expect from a solid film of polysaccharides, for example. So if you take a solvent casted native polysaccharide film, because polysaccharides, if you don't do anything to them, they would just burn into a pile of ashes. Uh, we solvent cast them and you look at the X-ray scattering spectra. We see that if you look at very small length scales, so this is two to three inverse angstroms, or in terms of real space, you're looking at less than one nanometer length scales, smaller than one nanometer. So here you see the distance between covalently bonded units, for example. If you go a bit to the left where you see these two peaks, then you're starting to see uh, maybe mono, mono, monosaccharide, monosaccharide distances, the distance between an arabinose unit and a silos unit, or maybe you're seeing the, different, the distance between two arabinose chains in a film. And then a very low hue, you're looking at larger structures and in the solvent cassette film, most likely you're seeing cracks, voids and defects. Uh, so this is the chemistry of what we did to get these melt compressible films. I will not talk about them in detail, but they are here. But in a sense, what we do is we have a ring opening reaction, which kind of gives flexible hinges in the stiff chains. So we think that as a stiff polysaccharide chain, if we add flexible hinges, then they can become more flexible. And in terms of making a plastic, flexibility would make the material more soft and also more easy to process by heat. We modify the chemical structure a bit by adding hydrophobic side groups. And that is also a flexible molecule. So in a way it's, it reduces the interactions between the polysaccharides themselves as well. And they are also flexible parts. So they also make the material softer and more flexible. And then if you look at it in X-ray, you see quite a large difference. You can see that in these black, green, blue curves, you see that there is an extra peak that comes just from doing the modification. And yeah, and on the left, you see a picture of a not so polysaccharide like film. So this is obtained from melt processing. And what we concluded from this and from looking at other data was that there is kind of a phase separation that is going on. When you modify a polysaccharide with hydrophobic side groups, they are not perfectly miscible. So what you see is that the side groups here shown in gray they kind of aggregate to form their own small nanodomain, nanophase separation. And then you have polysaccharides that are forming their own domains or either that or they are forming kind of like a, a wall or a network around these side chains. And we see that as a additional peak here. And then you can see that the, some of them have a bit more crystalline regions. So they have more peaks than the other ones. Some of them, for example, such as the black one has a peak that is a bit smaller and a bit narrower. And in terms of X-ray scattering, this means that the, the phase separation is smaller and because it's more on the right. And the narrowness of the peak means that it's kind of more ordered. There is less of a poor dispersity in the sizes of these domains. They're, basically, they're more ordered and they pack closer and we expect that this can potentially have an effect on the material properties. So to remind you again of the tensile testing graph that I showed you in the beginning. So the films that are coming from the blue material correspond to the blue curve and so on. And the materials that is very, very brittle is actually this green slope here. So what we can extract from this basically is that since you see these very extra sharp peaks that are appearing, and you also see that the slope in the low part is a bit different from the other ones. This tells you that there are ordered structures and there are maybe nano size, micro size in homogenized that are forming. And if you look at the films, which I'm not sure if I actually have those film pictures. Okay, I do. Perfect. I will skip that. I can skip that. So if you look at these, so we are trying to understand really why different polysaccharide films behave differently. And you see that the films that you get from this green one 
is actually kind of crystalline. And we know that silent itself, if you have a very lowly substitute to silent, it can be crystalline. And it seems like the part of this ordered structure has transferred over from the starting material to the final material. You see that there are sharper peaks here and there all around the X-ray scattering spectra. And this, we hypothesize that these ordered structures in the material are creating a lot of fracture points. So when you try to pull these films there, there's a lot more spots where there is a weak, there's a weak and there's a strong part. So that when you pull them, they kind of fracture quite easily. And that is why you see that in tensile testing, they are quite brittle. Uh, if you try to, then we have tried to see if there's a difference when you look at the thermal transitions. So in when you do polymer science and you try to understand when the material was softened, you will look at the modulus as a function of temperature. You can see that it is not that different from the other ones. It softens quite well already below zero. So then in this case, it is actually that the ordered structures are creating fracture points. That is our conclusion as to why this particular material causes a very brittle modified product. And now we are trying to understand the other two. Uh, and this is in, for the 0 0.5 and 0 0.9, we see that if we start with a Arabino silent that is quite highly branched, we don't get the same crystalline or macroscopically homogeneous structures anymore. Uh, the films are, for the most part, they are very transparent and they're very nice. But then we are trying to explain why one of them is so soft and one of them is so rigid. And then there we look quite a bit into the X-ray structure, the X-ray scattering structures. You can see there's a big, one of them has a very big phase separated nano domain. The other one has a bit smaller nano domain. When we look at them at different temperatures, we also see that the one that is more small and ordered does not change so much with temperature. So in a way, these phase separated nano domains are more stable with temperature and they kind of kind of act as temporary crosslinks or they kind of act as more rigid sections that are keeping these chains from moving so much. And that is that is one of the reasons we expect we have a size for the one with a, re, a ratio 0 0.5 to be less soft. And you can see that the 0 0.9 then changes quite a bit with temperature. In the DMA, uh, dynamic, dynamic mechanical testing, we see that the blue one also softens a lot with temperature. And we see a more, how do you call it, a more steep decrease. Whereas with the black one, we see a more linear, a more flat plateau. And in terms of polymer science theory, this is, so these motions are related to the beta alpha relaxation. So they are related to how, how much motions the different parts that the polysaccharide has. So, in the beginning, we are getting very small movements. These are very short vibrations, ro chain rotations that are associated with side chains or very small sections of the chains that are vibrating. When you increase the temperature, these polysaccharides gain much more energy and freedom. So the entire chain starts to move. And that is when we see that the material softens significantly. And it is very, very complicated how you look at these, but we kind of concluded that the black one has a much more hindered movement. And that seems to be related again to the structures that we are forming that is ordered, stable, and less resistant, uh, more resistant to temperature changes. So in a way, as I was saying, it is these nano phase separated domains that are acting as anchor points or crosslinks that are preventing the polysaccharides from moving so much. So when you heat them up, it takes more heat energy to allow them to move flexibly. And that is why they are stiffer in tensile. Uh, and that was it for what I have in mind. So if you were to have any take home messages, I would think that there are many different ways where you can look at polysaccharides. You can look at solution state, where you look at how well dissolve, how well disperse, are they forming nanoparticles? particles? Are they forming fully stabilized polysaccharides? And that, in a way it's related to their surface adhesion properties to the, to the if you want to do narrow particle tuning. If you look at more condensed matter, then you're looking at specific spaces between, if you're looking at very, how do you call it, very sharp, very more ordered organized structures. So in that case, that is more related to films or 
polymers, for example. So there are different ways to look at polysaccharides and different structures you will see and how you can correlate that to their properties. Thank you very much. I hope it was not too confusing. Thank you.